Awesome. Uh, I hope uh, you all can listen, um, hear me. And uh, all right. So thanks, Nisha, for the introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good uh, your time of the day, and hope you all are doing well. Uh, thanks for coming for coming to our talk. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Hannah for setting the stage for us because uh, uh, now attendees have an uh, understanding of what the service mesh is, and so that now I and Tilo can uh, build on top of it. Like uh, it's a really good segue into the performance aspect of the service mesh. So uh, yeah, next uh, next slide. Uh, so, like, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, we are already introduced, but yeah, still, I'm Suresh Deshmukh. I, I work on locomotive, uh, uh, the Kubernetes distribution of Kinfolk, and my co speaker is Tilo. He's uh, a director of OSN security and leads the Flatcar team. Uh, Flatcar uh, Container Linux, uh, it is a new avatar of uh, CoreOS Container Linux. Uh, over to the next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, a little bit of introduction of my employer, uh, Kinfolk. Uh, so uh, we do software right from uh, kernel to the application level. Uh, of course, Kubernetes in between. And uh, so yeah, in, in one line, we like to uh, say like we are Kubernetes and Kubernetes Linux experts. And uh, uh, like Nisha said, uh, we'll take questions at the end. Uh, next slide. So, uh, 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 I, I, I'll talk about the agenda first because uh, the uh, like Simon Sinek likes to say, let's start with why. Uh, so we'll look at why we have chosen uh, a certain way to collect metrics and the rationale behind it, uh, like uh, everything from sample size to statistical spread and things like that. And uh, then we'll go on to look at the implementation, the engineering aspects of uh, how we have set up this framework and how we have collected various metrics from various clusters. And finally, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll end with a, on a practical note by looking at the demo, how it all fits together. So at the end of the talk, you will learn how, to, uh, how we build the pre uh, benchmark framework and our learnings from it. So if you, if you feel, uh, feel like uh, using it, you, you will get, a, get a good idea. And if you want to build uh, something similar, uh, you'll also get some inspiration. So uh, from here, uh, over to Tilo. Um, thank you, Suraj. So let's start with some theory, the rationale behind um, the benchmarks that we did. So the metrics that we'll be looking at um, indeed cover three of the four golden signals. So um, thanks for bringing this up, um, Hannah. The goal that we have, the overall um, goal of our uh, benchmark is um, to determine the cost of operating service mesh. Um, it is generally a comparative benchmark. So we are looking at the differences between um, different service meshes. Um, we're looking at regular use cases, so there won't be any cluster overload. Uh, the data we collect focus mostly on um, request response latency as Hannah already raised, that's the one that you can't uh, compensate easily with just throwing money at your cluster. We also look at um, CPU and memory usage of both the control plane of the service mesh and the sidecars in our benchmarks. And we'll have control metrics, and those are um, there to make sure that we really don't do any, that, that we really don't run into overload situations. So. We'll be looking at the request response error rate of our um, load generator. And um, we'll be looking at CPU and memory usage of the application under load and the benchmarking tool. And if those saturate um, the limits and the nodes they're on, then we're ob obviously uh, not in a regular use case, but um, we're running into an overload. The sample size and statistical spread is something that um, I've seen ignored in quite a few benchmark results um, that have been published out there. So we run our benchmarks as many clusters actually run in an infrastructure as a service environment that um, our IAS provider um, serves us in their data centers. We have limited control over this environment. So when we do our benchmarks, um, we want to make sure to have enough data in order to identify and remove strong outliers in the data. For instance, we could have a lemon host in the cluster that would 
um, skew our data. We could have noisy networks. So basically neighbors that do a lot of network traffic, which um, impacts latency, buggy top of rack switches and things like that. And we, we wanna identify those and basically exclude those from the results. And then there are variations um, that we need to include uh, and that basically just cover the statistical spread of the data that we're collecting. So there may be some variator of the servers and the network equipment that you're using. Uh, we don't know if like all of the hardware runs the same firmware versions. We don't know about hardware revisions. And that is just diversity that um, the environment introduces and it just, that you just can't escape, it's always there. If you use data centers, you need to make sure um, to have those covered um, in your benchmarks if you don't host yourself. So we basically repeat um, the same runs multiple times, um, both on the same cluster, one after each other, as well as um, on multiple clusters that have the same hardware spec. We just basically try to gauge um, the uh, statistical spread that we're seeing that that we we'll be that we need to cover in the data. So if you look at um, charts, <laughs> you see that uh, it's neat. You see latency, right? But um, this chart is a lie because it's a single snapshot. It doesn't tell you anything. So what you want to see is um, at least uh, the the amount of um, the, the ranges that your um, that your tests run into. Otherwise, um, you may you may even look at an outlier. Uh, but um, in any case, you will have no idea about the minimum and maximum spread of the data that you're collecting. And that's particularly important when you're when you're comparing. Um, service meshes with, um, that, that are supposed to add minimal latency, right? All right, um, as another uh, thing that we're doing, we, we wanna have our benchmark um, user experience centric. So Hannah had this great um, animation in her talk where you could see the insides of, uh, of your cluster of your micro architecture um, environment. And you could see requests and responses of an in individual latencies going back and forth. This is not what we want to measure. Um, so we like to take the position of the user, and the user always uses this, the whole application that runs in your cluster. And your application um, then consists of individual microservices, and we want to cover that in our benchmarks. So a single user action fed into your application, which consists of multiple microservices, will cause many microservice endpoints to be called. So the, the, the benchmark we're gonna run um, is user-centric and will basically interface with your cluster as a big application instead of um, just covering individual endpoints latencies. That's very important for us. And then we have a very specific way of measuring um, latency overall, and it's also uh, factors into the user-centric side of things. Um, there's this um, developer, Gil Tanner, who can explain it a lot better um, than I can. And there's this YouTube, YouTube talk that you should watch. And he, he coined the term coordinated omission. So that's discarding data that just basically feels like it's not there, but in fact, it's hugely user impacting. So um, taking coordinated omission into account allows us to reflect the user experience on wait time and looking at latency. And instead of measuring the request per second uh, individually, we actually measure committed uh, RPS over time. So to give you an example, if you have a user action that causes in your cluster 100 endpoint requests and your application uh, commits to, on average, 100 um, RPS across services, that's 10 milliseconds per request on average, then the user expects one second of wait time. But if one of those 100 requests has a stall for one second um, and all of the other complete um, in 10 seconds, then uh, in 10 milliseconds, then the user will have a 200% um, wait time of what uh, the user expected. Um, and we don't think that um, many uh, traditional ways to measure latency actually reflects that. So if you look at um, the example in terms of uh, statistics, we have 99 requests that go over 10 milliseconds and one request that takes a second. And this is kind of what it looks like, right? Um, if you take the average on uh, the per request kind of view of thing, then you have 20 milliseconds on average, 
you have five milliseconds P25 because that's below the 10 milliseconds average, obviously. P50 is 10 milliseconds because that's what the application guarantees. P75 is 15 milliseconds. And even in P99, you don't see this one outlier, even though it's highly impacting for your user. But if you instead look at the time of things, then you see 980 milliseconds that have 10 milliseconds um, latency response times on average. And then we see one second that has 1,000 millisecond response time. And if you factor that into uh, the equation, then you see that your average latency, if you measure over time and not over individual requests, is 500 milliseconds. Because you spend two seconds on something that should have taken you a second. Um, and the uh, latency reflects much better in the um, percentiles of what you're measuring. So that's the approach that we're taking. And um, how do we fix that when, when measuring latency on a technology level? Well, so to get started, we need to feed the expected or committed request per second into our benchmark. Um, so if we start with committing to 100 requests per second, that's one request every 10 milliseconds. We expect the first request to go out at zero milliseconds, the second at 10 milliseconds, the third at 20 milliseconds. So if one of those has larger than 10 milliseconds latency, then the succeeding request will not go out in time. And that again is easy to, um, to map in software. So our fix is instead of measuring latency at the point in time where the request goes out, we start measure, measuring latency at the point in time where the request should have gone out. Um, and that gives us this great um, time focus and very, very user-centric view of things. And let's hand over to Suraj for the implementation point. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tilo. Uh, I think we can start from the next slide. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, this, this slide shows you how the setup looks like benchmarking. Like we have one controller cluster. Like uh, this is all locomotive, uh, which is Kubernetes behind the scene. Uh, and like all the logos that you see behind, uh, like they are deployed. So like controller cluster has a Prometheus deployed with a storage backed by uh, OpenEBS. Uh, like this storage is quite quite large. Like uh, so that can store all the metrics coming from various. And, the, uh, and, and then on the uh, controller cluster is going to help us to visualize all the metrics we have scraped. And down, uh, down below, you see all the leaf clusters that uh, have been deployed uh, from controller cluster. So each leaf uh, cluster has uh, various components like uh, open EBS again for storage, for, uh, to back storage of Prometheus. Uh, Contour and Metal LB, they, uh, uh, they help you to uh, expose your application over the internet because uh, uh, we deployed on uh, on packet cloud, and they don't uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the the right way to expose your application over the internet on packet cloud is using Metal LB, uh, and then at these endpoints on the uh, 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 the endpoints on the leaf clusters are then uh, scraped by controller clusters. We also have external DNS uh, in use here, uh, so that when Prometheus and Prometheus is deployed on these leaf clusters, uh, there is a DNS entry made for it in the AWS, so that controller cluster can uh, knows where to where to scrape from. And uh, Linkerd and Istio, uh, as you see, like uh, these were the two uh, service meshes we uh, uh, we did benchmarking on, and they are deployed as as needed, like uh, as as the tests progress. Uh, we also have metric server. Uh, there is no logo for it, so, but it is needed because uh, uh, Istio uh, uses a horizontal pod autoscaler and uh, it auto scales as the load increases. And uh, we will later also see how, how controller cluster knows about the Prometheus's, Prometheus or various Prometheus running on the leaf clusters. So yeah, over to next slide. So this whole thing that happens at the at the root level or the controller cluster that you see, it uh, is all done by this one uh, Helm chart called orchestrator Helm chart. Uh, 
So, uh, so apart from, like I said before, open EBS and Prometheus, uh, there is also this help chart deployed on the uh, control cluster. And uh, so it does various things, like it has uh, multiple jobs. They download uh, Helm, they download uh, 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 the charts as well, and Terraform, which is needed by the uh, locomotive deployer, LocoCTL. Uh, also builds local CTL because we were uh, like also experimenting with it. So we could always, uh, we could give this commit and then it will build local CTL. And all these uh, binaries and Helm charts and everything is available in this one volume. So uh, this orchestrator application has access to it. Now orchestrator Helm chart has one Golang application, which actually uh, runs multiple Kubernetes jobs. And then these jobs go and create these uh, leaf clusters. Uh, uh, and like uh, the, if, if job reports a failure, then it starts again because the Kubernetes job, so it is started again. And since it is backed by a volume, uh, we don't lose on any manifest or any configuration that was used for creating a cluster. Uh, uh, earlier, uh, earlier uh, uh, like in the design process, uh, we used to like uh, uh, delete the whole cluster if there was a failure in the job. That turned out to be very cumbersome. So. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't uh, delete it now and we just leave, uh, even after jobs are completed or failed or whatever, uh, the configs stay there and uh, someone can always go go back using this one debug pod that is always running and then uh, do whatever, like delete the cluster or whatever. And uh, also, uh, like like I said, like we have this one volume which has all, all binaries and configs and everything. Uh, so this, uh, uh, yeah, this this helped uh, uh, across uh, all the jobs, and uh, and finally, like none of the scripts. Uh, I mean, this this is all uh, backed by a, a bash script right now, uh, like for the jobs, uh, jobs that uh, start leaf clusters. Uh, none of these scripts were baked into Docker images because uh, uh, anytime you wanted to make a change, uh, you don't want to build a Docker image, push it to a registry, and uh, pull it again and test it. So uh, the best way to do such kind of things is uh, create a config map from that scripts and mount it as a volume. And so, so anytime you make a change, it's only Helm upgrade and uh, the thing starts again. So that's uh, one of the learnings. And uh, yeah, over to the next uh, slide. Thanks. So uh, the, the like every job, like I said, uh, uh, it is, uh, it is backed by this orchestrator application. So it, it runs Kubernetes jobs, which deploy leaf clusters. And then uh, uh, it, it deploys external DNS, Prometheus, Grafana, uh, and all that, uh, except for Istio and Linkerd, because uh, we, we, we do that later when we start the benchmark runs. Uh, since, uh, and since this uh, controller uh, cluster jobs, like these jobs are running on the controller cluster, the root cluster, uh, this is where, uh, when it when it is deploying these uh, child or leaf cluster, this is where we do the uh, registering part. Like this is where uh, the root Prometheus knows about these uh, uh, child Prometheus, and that's how Prometheus from root scripts from this child. Uh, so uh, yeah, and then uh, we also like uh, during the benchmark runs, we also deploy push gateway before before starting benchmark runs. And uh, let's see what benchmark runs look like. Uh, over to the next slide. Thanks. So, uh, look like you can see these are like uh, three nested for loops uh, for every request per second, like 500, 1000, 1500. Uh, we, we, run, uh, uh, we, we run the for loop for five times and we run it for three types of uh, service mesh, uh, Linkerd, Istio, and no service mesh. So uh, we still call it service mesh. And uh, so, so every time what happens is it, the service mesh is installed. Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's bare metal, I mean, if, it, if there is no service mesh, then we don't do anything. We just return from that function. Uh, then we install this Emoji Auto application. So Emoji Auto is a dummy application that Linkerd ships. And uh, so it was used so that like uh, the, we, we needed to simulate the, uh, the, the uh, microservices architecture. And after that is then this run benchmark function uh, deploys the actual WRK to Helm chart. Uh, this is where the job runs uh, uh, by taking all these parameters, it starts firing all these requests. 
and finally we run the merge job so that all the metrics are uh, are sent to push gateway and finally when this uh, all, like bo when both the jobs are done uh, we delete the emoji voter applications again and clean the mesh so uh, we clean it every time because uh, let's say when you deploy istio uh, and like uh, you're deploying this application the proxy is injected by uh, if proxy is injected by the uh, the mutating uh, webhook uh, that is always running so so we need different proxies for different service meshes and we need no proxy when there is no service mesh so that's why every time we install and every time we clean at the end uh, so this is the the core of uh, what happens in there uh, all to next slide yeah uh, so at the node level you this is how a particular leaf cluster looks like so there are these multiple workload nodes where emoji auto applications are running and then there is one benchmark node where, which is running your wrk2 application so all the requests from benchmark node uh, from wrk2 are fired to uh, this emoji auto application you can see like uh, all of them are of same type this machine type is uh, available on the packet cluster and uh, the controller is just single because there is no I mean, not that much load on the uh, uh, on the control plane of kubernetes so it's just one more uh, over to next slide so uh, like i said before so wrk2 is used to generate the load and measure latency and emoji auto as a demo app and uh, it is deployed in like uh, in multiple times in multiple applications so you can always tweak that how many applications you want depending on how, how much you want to stress the whole thing uh yeah over to next and uh, so so locomotive uh, I, I think i didn't mention it before so all like when i say components we have this uh, notion of uh, uh, components or uh, all the helm charts are sort of baked and the configs that these components provide are supported by uh, by by kinfolk uh, as a part of locomotive so linkerd and istio we have added as experimental right now and uh, if uh, if you want to check out you can just download the local ctl binary and uh, uh, so you can deploy the cluster and these components. Uh, so once you get the slides, you'll have the links as well. Uh, sure, uh, over to the next slide. So uh, we saw the earlier for image that we saw, it was uh, the node level uh, flow of data. Uh, this is what happens at the pod level. So you can see like WRK2, uh, that job is uh, uh, first of all, sending all these HTTP requests to various applications. And once all the metrics are uh, collected uh, by WRK2, they're pushed to the Prometheus push gateway. Now the, now, so uh, why push gateway, uh, you might ask. So, uh, so Prometheus uh, is very good, it is a, has a full mechanism of metrics. Uh, now something that is very short lived like a Kubernetes job, how, how do you live in? It's, uh, it, it's uh, not very efficient in terms of like, uh, by the time Prometheus starts scraping, like discovers this job and starts scraping metrics from it, uh, the job might have died and uh, you might lose out on metrics. So push gateway acts as a, uh, as a stopgap solution here where you push all your metrics to push gateway and then Prometheus scrapes it from the push gateway. And uh, like you can see here, like the Prometheus, uh, like every every leaf cluster has a Prometheus. And like I explained earlier, the root cluster then scrapes from this Prometheus, which we haven't seen uh, shown here, but that's what happens. Like the root scrapes from this Prometheus. So we have metrics from all these leaf clusters in one root cluster so that you can, you can see metrics from various clusters so that we, uh, to increase the spread. Uh, so, yeah, uh, over to next slide. Uh, yeah, then now we can see the demo of how, how it all happens. Uh, thanks, Suraj. Okay, so that was the implementation of the architecture that um, that we built. And um, all of those levels are individually reusable, so you don't need to set up a um, orchestrator cluster or, or um, controller cluster to get leaf clusters. You don't need leaf clusters to run those benchmarks in your own clusters. Um, just have a look at the repo later and see which parts you can use. What I'm going to demo now is if I just quickly this basically. 
this is what we're going to looking at, be looking at. So it's a single leaf cluster. Um, it'll be pretty low level. I'll start a single benchmark for you. Um, before we can start a benchmark, obviously we need to provision. But um, since you know the technology behind provisioning a cluster is pretty amazing, but um, looking a cluster actually being provisioned is kind of like looking paint, uh, watching paint dry. Um, we skip that episode and start right where the action is. So you'll get a recap that shows you, we checked out the um, service mesh benchmark repo. We did a few um, changes in the configuration that um, needs changes to make things work in the environment. We created a uh, variables file, which um, we filled with uh, backend information that um, Terraform needs to use in order to work and to share state. And then we applied and then the cluster got deployed. It takes a little longer than that, but um, that's basically the gist of it. Now, we can take a look at our cluster. And we see we have three worker nodes, we have our controller, and we have one load generator node. Those three worker nodes uh, are exclusive for the application, and the load generator node is um, exclusive for the benchmark uh, tool. Namespaces-wise, I prepared um, the application already. You see four instances of Emoji Voto deployed. We just use, uh, sorry, five. We just use five different namespaces for that, which gives us um, different URLs for the endpoints, and thus uh, we're simulating a more complex um, application. If we look at the pods in uh, in the single namespace, we see the three microservices Emoji Body consists of. All of those microservices will have um, endpoints. And we'll cover, cover all namespaces and all um, microservices in them. All right. Now, the results of those benchmarks will be displayed in a Grafana dashboard that we call the um, benchmark cockpit. That is um, set up to give you um, an overview of individual benchmarks. You'll be able to introspect um, benchmark data. Uh, and you'll you'll be able to see the benchmark running. Now let's start the benchmark. Whoops. <laughs> That's the demo effect. No. There's my helm command. <laughs> It's reasonably complex, so it's um, it's a good idea to have this in your history. Um, and this basically deploys WRK2 um, and um, tells WRK2 that there are five applications, that's the five Emoji Volta instances um, to benchmark. It sets a um, committed RPS, which is uh, 50 RPS, because we're going to take it low here. Um, it sets the duration to two, two minutes, um, 24 connections. That's 24 WRK threads. And um, it gives an uh, initialization delay of 10 seconds. So um, that's, that's useful for getting your, um, your benchmark pod meshed, which in this case won't happen because we're doing a bare metal, bare metal benchmark. Now Helm installs this. We see a benchmark namespace appearing. And WRK2 is running in that. You should be seeing a uh, new entry in the benchmark lists here. And that's basically the, um, the currently active benchmark. We see that it's 8% uh, done. Um, and this will refresh as the benchmark is running. You can see the um, average and current RPS that um, is being emitted while the benchmark is running. And it's not stellar, it's just 50 RPS, and that's for demo purposes, obviously. Um, you folks do your own gauging um, and uh, determine your own um, RPS rates. In the middle section of the dashboard, you can um, introspect service mesh resource usage, 
which we currently don't see because we're not benchmarking a service mesh, um, things run on their metal. If we scroll down a bit, we see our uh, control data. So we have the um, memory usage and load generated by the benchmark um, tool. It's pretty, it's pretty low. Um, the load is 0, 0.0 something, and um, it takes 1.4 gigabytes of RAM, and we have plenty left. You see the same here for all of the more remote applications, um, that's the microservices. So we can have a, um, a kind of control mechanism um, to validate that we're really not overloading anything. And uh, we also have a bird's eye view on the cluster, which is the load on all of the cluster nodes, which is also quite manageable. As soon as the benchmark reaches 100%, we will see results in the below results section, which right now doesn't have any data because the benchmark did not finish. I was speaking too fast. 97. So results should pop up any second. Here we are. Those are the results of this specific benchmark run. We see a little bit of statistics. We have transport errors, which are all zero. So this is a good benchmark run. Uh, we have latency percentiles here, and we have a very detailed breakdown of latency percentiles down here to dive deeper. Now, um, single benchmark runs are very nicely into, uh, introspectable using this dashboard, but um, to really, um, get uh, a summary of things. We created a summary dashboard. So this will, will show you comparative uh, latencies of um, service meshes compared to bare metal runs. And um, since Cortana wasn't really built uh, and Prometheus wasn't really built to display non-time series related data, this is kind of a little, um, manual. So what we need to do now in order to refresh this, in order to feed our, um, our benchmark run into that, is we need to run a separate job that is the metrics merger. So the metrics merger will simply um, take all the benchmark runs that are in, um, in Prometheus, merge them to um, produce merge metrics and feed those merge metrics into the push gateway where they are picked up by the dashboard here. It's actually a pretty, it's actually a pretty, um, a pretty quick job. So it should have completed by now it's done. And uh, we can refresh this dashboard and we'll see here a new run. Uh, having popped up. This is, this is a little um, almost abusive to, uh, to Grafana's charts that we're doing here. And it's just to um, basically display all of the different percentiles that we have in the data. And since the Prometheus push gateway will continuously feed the um, merge data into um, Prometheus, just waiting a little will basically give us the display um, that we need. And then we have uh, an overview of all of the runs. The first section of the dashboard uh, has a comparative overview and um, we can scroll down and can basically introspect bare metal, um, Linkerd and Istio percentiles individually. I did a few runs before um, this presentation to just warm up a little data for you. So there's um, data in this, um, in this dashboard already. Now, something else this dashboard is very good for is spotting outliers. And there is a bare metal outlier right here. If you look at the higher percentiles, we see a spike in latency. And it's, it's a little more than 80 times the latency um, that we've seen in every single other benchmark. So chances are that we had a noisy neighbor or something else going on here. So the dashboard offers you the option to actually exclude runs, which we're gonna do. Now, this is the um, offensive run, it's now excluded, and data can be looked at um, without this run. So as Suraj mentioned, the 
um, the controller um, cluster will have the merge latencies of every single of the leaf clusters. So there is a special version of this dashboard for the controller cluster um, that gives you information of the uh, where this benchmark ran on, on the specific leaf clusters as well. Now, if you're interested to dive into a specific benchmark here, um, for instance, for some reason, we want to introspect um, this specific run. And we can click the link, and that will take us to the um, to the uh, benchmark cockpit again. And the, it, this is frozen in time um, at exactly the time span where this benchmark happened. So we can, for instance, introspect uh, all of the running benchmark data. We can look at the results. We can see if there are any transport errors that have happened, or we can give a get a detailed breakdown um, of the latencies. Basically, everything that um, the cockpit has to offer. As a closing note, I said that we're benchmarking whole whole um, applications, and we consider the cluster to be the application. Um, so one of the statistics we have in the um, results section is for every single endpoint, um, the actual amount of calls uh, of requests that this specific endpoint received. This is something that you can configure in the um, in the benchmark helm chart. So if you want to have a different um, distribution of endpoint calls, you can just uh, edit the simple text file and it will get you there. And that concludes our presentation. So. So thank you very much. This was very interesting to me. And um, I, I've, I've read the article, I think it's already one year old. What the article you wrote about Linkerd benchmarking and Istio. And um, actually when we built service mesh.es, we were thinking about doing a benchmark and then we were like, no, this is, this is crazy. You know, you have to know many things to do benchmarking correctly and reading your article and also the comments, people like, ah, no, you need to do this and that. So I think this was a lot of work. Um, so thank you very much for, for doing it. And um, my, my questions are, um, the benchmark you just did, did you, did you do it with the latest versions? Um, those are the in-development versions that we have in, in uh, Locomotive. So Raj has more details on that. So we, we started migrating Istio and um, Linkerd into Locomotive as components. This is ongoing work, as Suraj mentioned, it's ex experimental. So we would by no means call this a comparative benchmark right now. The, the thing we're presenting mm. today is just the, um, the uh, automation environment around it. Um, and also, so it, it's by accident, Istio and, and Linkerd, because that's what we integrated with Locomotive. It can be done with yeah. any service measure, obviously. It's just for the benchmark part, uh, it's just naming, that's all. Yeah. Suraj, do you want to elaborate a little on uh, Istio and Linkerd components? Yep. Uh, the, the Istio version, I think it's the, the one before uh, the, I mean, when, we, when we did the second avatar of the uh, second service mesh benchmark, we wanted to like, you know, make it a framework so that others can use as well. Mm -hmm. That's when we integrated uh, Linkerd and, uh, and, and Istio. So we used Istio operator for it to deploy it. And for Linker, Linker is the latest table, not the edge one, uh, not the edge okay. channel one. So you're you're already um, using the the STOD component. I mean the the yeah. yeah. Okay, and I, I would expect that they have been improved. The 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 performance has improved since one point five because I've only seen um, blog posts and benchmarks for all the versions which is not very interesting if you look at the current versions. So I, I saw in the, in the benchmark that they are pretty much the same, right? The, the current uh, Istio and Linkerd versions. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's really not a uh, quantifiable, uh, this, this is really not quantifiable data. It's just something I fired up yesterday on Packet and um, ran a few things. Ah. Uh, so there's not, no optimization going on here and we haven't looked into, uh, into any of that. Um, the, the thing we didn't really, 
flight finish um, one year ago when we did the initial benchmark is, so we were, we were quite dissatisfied with the level of automation that we had in mm. our, our benchmark, yeah. um, in our service mesh benchmark suit. And that has changed a lot in the, in the recent months. Like there's been significant improvements into it in, I think all parts of it. So mm. why are we set up now to do like another round of benchmarks? We didn't really do them now. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't start with 50 requests per second, right? But <laughs> comparing the two, I guess they can deliver slightly more. So, um, uh, so the benchmark you showed was for 50 yeah. requests. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, we, we're saying that we're testing clusters in regular operating conditions, but, um, I think you can push it a little further than 50. Mm, okay. To get, to get a quick demo done and have no, um, you know, live demo uh, uh, badness is happening to us. So just mm. if, if you're driving it the safe way. But so, so where are you heading with it? Will you focus on introducing the other meshes too? Or will you, you know, push the limits of, of Linkerd and Istio and, and see what happens? Or will you introduce other test applications? What's your plan? So we were looking at other test applications um, a little. Uh, they're, they're not hard to integrate. You best, if, mm. if they're automated and if they can be, be deployed automatically, then um, it's, it's pretty straightforward to do. The thing with Emoji Voto is um, it turns out to be quite efficient. So um, the first thing we did, uh, because we have Emoji Voto pretty well integrated in the test suite, the first thing we did is we just tried to push it as hard as we can on bare metal. And turns out this thing can do a lot of requests per second without introducing mm. much additional latency and with no errors at all. So it's perfect for, um, for using it as a, as a test application. I don't wanna talk bad about other um, demo applications, but we also tested the book info or books one that uh, comes mm -hmm. with Link Istio. And, or even with Istio and mm -hmm. couldn't really push it harder than 50 or 100 requests per second without massive um, errors and, and delays, which is probably a good thing if you want to deliver a demo application for a service mesh, because then you have something for debugging, right? Mm. But um, it's it's not a good thing if you want to want to run a benchmark. If there is um, if there is any other target application that we should be looking at, uh, we, we're taking we're taking patches and PRs. Like this is the whole service mesh benchmark project is an open source project. We're on GitHub. Um, if you want to automate things, yes, please. Mm. So do you think people could, because if you remember in my talk, I said, I, I advise people to do their own benchmark with their own application. And I was writing my master thesis on, on service mesh and I did my own benchmark and I was like, okay, I will just measure, you know, by hand with, with cube control stats and, you know, and I said, okay, Hannah, you cannot reproduce this one. You, you just do it once and you have no idea if, if there's, you know, something going on, which, you, which will be very different next time. So I think for many people, it would be really interesting to, to see how their own application performs. Do you think this could be done? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as mentioned, the, the, the service mesh benchmark suite that, that um, the version 2.0 that we've uh, worked on and that's now pretty much done um, has like several layers where you could just uh, uh, mm -hmm. interface with. You don't, you don't even need to go as far as um, deploying your own locomotive cluster. So if you have a cluster up and running, um, you can use the benchmark pods right away. As long as you have Grafana where you can put the dashboards, which are also in the repository. So there are JSON exports for, for Grafana dashboards um, for the cockpit and summary one. Um, you just use Helm to uh, deploy the um, WRK pod um, and you configure just your own applications endpoints in the, in the Helm chart before deploying. And then this thing runs, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as you have a push gateway where you can point the WRK pod to, to deliver their data, then the dashboard will work. And um, so that's like the lowest level you can interface and you can use from the, from the automation suite. Of course, if you want to do a comparative benchmark, like what service mesh is best for me, um, you would need to do manually what is automated in the, um, in the service mesh benchmark um, suite. So you basically have to remove um, 
whatever service mesh you were trying to get a bare metal um, benchmark, oh. you have to add it and then remove it again and put on the other um, service mesh that you want to benchmark against. And that is all good, right? I mean, because it's mm. still your own stuff and your own application. But um, if you want to have a comparison between multiple service meshes, then um, having the se uh, second layer of, of, um, of abstraction, uh, where locomotive basically does all of the legwork for you, um, it's probably good. It's probably a better idea. And with the framework, we are trying to be more generic. Like uh, right now, there are some uh, hard codings, I would say, but uh, yeah, mm. we are striving towards the uh, as generic as we can. So, if you if I want to add, let's say, the traffic mesh or console or something else. I, I just, uh, I have a file where I place the install, um, you know, commands and, and I could integrate it or... Service meshes, the, the, what they're currently doing, which is by no means uh, limited, uh, which should by no means limit the, uh, the way you would do things, but um, what they're currently doing is they're implementing the service meshes as components in locomotive. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, okay. it's, You're, also, mm. it's also an open source project, right? Um, mm. So the, to answer your question, um, you would you would go to the locomotive project and um, you know create a, either fork it or create a PR there that adds the mm. service as a component, which is cool if the which is easy and straightforward if the service mesh is just the hand chart um, yeah. or. Um, if it's, a, if it's a straightforward controller as we, as mm. we for, for, for Istio. And then um, you basically use locomotive uh, for the lowest level um, of automation. And you can mm. put the uh, service mesh benchmark uh, framework on top of it and it would run mm -hmm. your benchmarks. If that scares you, by no means you're limited to that. You can always uh, have your custom, uh, your own scripting around running benchmarks and only base things on the on the service mesh benchmark repo and um, install and remove your service mesh using using other scripting means. That works. Yeah, I think it's too bad they, uh, the the implementations they don't provide the information on their own performance. You know, if you look at the docs, it's you don't get this piece of information. So I, I think, I, yeah, it, as, uh, I think Istio does. But yeah. So there, there's a there's a metrics and benchmarking working group at, at um, CNCF, and that's probably the right level to kind of establish uh, this kind of mm. resource. Because I feel benchmarking is a thing that will always need um, an independent body uh, to carry yeah. out. It's 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 slightly political and. Well, we've noticed that with our first benchmark post, but um, that's that's yeah. just how things are, right? Yeah. And I get it. I mean, I get why people get um, uh, um, kind of, uh, you know, agitated when, when they, they read things about their favorite service. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking forward for your next blog post then. <laughs> it, it may still take a while. We have a, uh, we have a few things um, on our plans, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> 